Just so people understand what, what they're about to see and hear, all of this is channeled. It's um, the sounds, the, the tones, the movements. It's all channeled. It's their way of setting the tone for the message. And um, I don't control any of it. I don't do it to bring them in. They do it through me. I'm channeling them as soon as I decide to be channeling. Guy here. Welcome to my podcast. My epic guest today is Daniel Scranton, and he channels, and he's been channeling since 2010. I always find these conversations fascinating. I love pushing the boundaries of what's possible or what we think is possible. The more I've dived down the rabbit hole myself on my own personal journey, uh, the more surprised I've been. So I like to be surprised. Uh, Daniel's in a beautiful soul, and we get into his journey today, and he also channels towards the end of the podcast for us as well. And there's a lot of wisdom within this podcast, and I have no doubt you're going to get a lot out of it. If you're watching this right now, uh, we have a lot of events booked for 2024. We've got retreats going global. We're going to be in Europe next year, and we're also going to be in Bali next year, and of course, Australia. So if you want to join us in any of those, click the links below as well. Enjoy this podcast with Daniel. It's fascinating. Daniel, welcome to hey. the podcast. Good to be here, guy. It's amazing. I thought we were you were in Hawaii, and I, I really just learned that you're not far up the road in Brisbane. So welcome to Australia, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a permanent resident now, so it's cool. It's great. My daughter's a citizen now. Yeah. Love Fantastic. It so... My first question to you is, Daniel, like I ask everyone on the show, is that if uh, a complete stranger stopped you and asked you, uh, asked you what you did for a living on the street, what would you say? Well, it depends on the stranger. Um, <laughs> sometimes I say to people, I'm a spiritual teacher. And then other times I say, I'm a channeler. Um, because I, I kind of base that on whether I think the person has any clue as to what channeling is, or if I'd have any amount of ease in, in describing it to them, you know, uh, being able to make it uh, understandable for them. But I do like a challenge. So sometimes I'll just say I'm a channeler and, um, and take the challenge of being asked, well, what is that? <laughs> exactly. And I've been having a few channelers on the show over a period of time and i seem to be um gravitating to guests like yourself more and more how do you explain what channeling is to the layman if it, if it's completely new to them well i might say to them well you know what a medium is right because there's all these shows on television now about mediums so i'm sure you've seen or heard of a medium and then i say well i do something very similar to what a medium does except I don't connect with dead people. I connect with higher dimensional collectives mostly that exist in the non-physical and that are not recently deceased uh, loved ones here on earth. And I can always say um, like, you know, angels and fairies and some people wouldn't know what an ascended master is, but if I think that they would understand that, I would say ascended masters. Um, I, I tend to leave the ETs out um, unless I think the person is open to hearing about ETs. But I, you know, sometimes I will um, bring it up in conversation at like dinner, like I did with my in-laws the other night. I was like, you know, as they're eating octopus at a restaurant and I'm just sitting there not eating anything because I'm vegan, you know, <laughs> I'm like, um, you know, the, the scientists say that there's no way an octopus could possibly be from Earth. Like, that's what a scientist says. And my my brother-in-law said, well, does, does that mean they're challenging evolution theory now? And I said, no, it means they're opening up to the idea that ETs have come here, <laughs> you know, because that's what they essentially are. <laughs> and so sometimes I just say little things like that just to see if there's 
the, and I said to him, you know, I believe in ETs. So, you know, it's not a stretch for me to, to hear something like that and <laughs> accept it. Yeah. 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 It's that, that's not even a stretch when you think of the, you know, Earth, planet Earth and, and the vastness of the universe to say that we're alone is like, come on. Right. You know, it's, uh, it's a big stretch. Personally, that's how I feel. Yeah. So what was life like for you before channeling? I believe I heard you were even an atheist. Am I correct in saying that? I was at one time. Um, you were probably, I'm guessing from your accent, you were raised Catholic too, right? <laughs> I, was, I was actually raised outside of religion, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was raised Catholic. And then uh, I, I see it's funny because I feel like I've had all the experiences. I had the, the full on religion experience of like completely buying into all of it and thinking like, I have to please God. I have to be good. Um, you know, am I doing enough to be a good Christian? And of course we new agers do that to ourselves too. But, um, but then to, to go atheist and be like, you know, I don't believe in anything now. It was hard. It was a, it was a hard left turn to make because in, in atheism, there's not a lot of comfort, you know, but it was just, it didn't make sense to me that there was anything more than what we see and what we experience in this one lifetime. So I wasn't happy about being an atheist. Um, but I also wasn't searching as an atheist. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking like, Oh, maybe there is something out else out there and I'll believe it when I see it or when somebody proves it to me. But then lo and behold, a guy I was working for said, you need to listen to Tony Robbins personal power to, in order to be in this company. And I said, okay, I'll listen to it. And I liked it. You know, I found it interesting at least. Um, the first 12 interviews and then the 13th interview, which I almost didn't even see at, in the, in the CD case, cause there were three CDs in the final case. It was Deepak Chopra and I popped it in and it was Deepak and Deepak's talking about all this stuff that I agreed with. I, it made total sense to me. I was a, uh, a raw fooder and I still am, you know, and I, um, um, I like the idea that the body's, capable of healing itself. And, and I'm, I've believed that for a long time. So that was kind of like what Deepak would, would say in his talk with Tony Robbins and, and then other books I picked up of his and books on tape and lectures and stuff. He, everything he said made sense to me and it seemed like, okay, so now I understand the universe is this intelligent place where, there's a lot more going on than uh, the atheist may think where some atheists are also really into science. So it's getting, I think, harder and harder for a person with a scientific mind to deny that there's something. I mean, you can, uh, of course you can believe that, that the universe is intelligent and still not see it as having like any further implications than that. You know, we could still just be these these humans that are going to live and die for 80 something years. But for me, I don't know, maybe there was a deep desire in me to believe in something because I was very much, it was proven to me that there was more to existence just through the theory alone of, you know, what's going on in the quantum realm and how, how the universe responds to us and all of that. So I just went, in that same section of the library to Ram Das and Wayne Dyer and Yogananda and Eckhart Tolle and all these various teachers, I, I, you know, the Celestine prophecy. And it just got more and more conclusive to me that there's something bigger at play here. And, um, and that was before I had my own personal experiences. Once you have your own personal experiences with it, then you know it experientially, you know, there's more going on because you've experienced it. And that's a whole different level to be on. Yeah. Once you embody something and there's a difference between 
I guess the intellect and and the deep knowing, a deep truth, isn't it? And once you start to have yeah. those experiences, you can't you can't unknow them. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm curious to know when when did the curiosity with channeling start to come in? Was this something you you were gravitated to, or is it, how did it happen? Well, it's completely accidental, like most things have been in my life, like unplanned, um, reading all these books and I, and uh, suddenly, um, come across conversations with God. And after devouring those books, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who was like my very first spiritual teacher. And she said to me, Oh, you liked channeled material. You probably would like, um, Emmanuel's books. So then I picked up all three of Emmanuel's books. There were, I think, only three ever uh, published. And on the back of the one of the Emmanuel books, um, somebody in their blurb, it may have been Deepak Chopra actually, mentioned the Seth books. So then I had to start reading the Seth books. And to me, the Seth books still represent the most – comprehensive wise um words of wisdom that have ever been spoken i mean it's just seth is just unbelievably deep and covers so many topics and um i just was completely enthralled and from there i was joining seth online chat groups you know message boards and people on there kept mentioning Abraham, Abraham Hicks, and somebody that I became friendly with was like, you really have to check it out. So I checked out Abraham. And of course, Esther was still doing it. This is 2004. Esther's still out there doing it. And I always thought, oh, wouldn't it have been cool to be one of these people in Jane and Rob's apartment in Elmira, New York, like sitting there at the Seth Sessions live? And so once I found out there's a lady I can, I can go to and I, I got in my car eventually and drove from LA to Sedona to see uh, Esther and Abraham live for the first time and um, got in the hot seat that very first time I got to speak to Abraham. They basically predicted everything that's happening now. <laughs> and um, I had no idea. I, they didn't say you're going to be a channeler, but they saw, said you'll, you'll write several well-received books. And I have seven books on Amazon right now. And, you know, at times like all seven of them are in the top 100 in the channeling category on Amazon and in Kindle. So yeah, they, I think they've been well-received. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, after that I was hooked. I was buying as much of the recorded material, the books of Abraham and going to as many workshops. And I actually wound up doing eight cruises with Abraham Hicks. Um, so I wound up getting in the hot seat a total of 17 times. And um, by the end there, um, well, towards the end of my run going to those workshops was the time when I had all these things that had happened to me in 2010 you know, that started with um, Reiki, doing Reiki and my, my hands moving by themselves over people like I having no volition at all to make them move and they're moving over people's bodies and I'm going, what the heck is happening? Then my head's going like this and I'm like, oh, this is interesting now this is happening. And then I started going and I said, oh my God, channeling. So that was like, January of 2010 that that happened. And then by say November of 2010, I was channeling. So it took, it took time for it to develop into me being able to speak, but um, it just seemed like it was something that was going to happen and then did happen. Wow. Were you meditating on a regular basis with an intent to want to channel or was Never. it more just kind of just happening because of, wow. I, I owe a lot to meditation. Um, I was a person who basically had chronic fatigue, you know, like I could sleep and sleep well and still be tired in the day. 
and I couldn't nap. I didn't, didn't have the ability to nap. Uh, I didn't like the way I felt when I was on caffeine. So it was kind of like this, this all started even before I had that Deepak Chopra interview awakening. So even before then I was in my atheist phase and I go, um, let me see if I can take a nap and I'd lie down and I wouldn't be able to take a nap, but then I'd get up out of bed and I'd be like, Oh, I feel refreshed. And it was 20 minutes. I was lying there for 20 minutes. Well, let me see if um, I set the alarm, the old fashioned alarm clock for 20 minutes from now. Um, this is, you know, be the following day. And um, after 20 minutes, the alarm will go off and I'll get up and I'll feel refreshed. And then eventually I thought, not why I don't want to set an alarm. Let me see how many breaths it takes me to breathe <laughs> in 20 minutes. And I'd count my breathing and that's meditation. So I, you know, it's a form of meditation. There's, there's lots of different ways to do it, mm -hmm. but I basically was self-taught with meditation before I even would have used that word to describe it as meditation. And from that time in the late nineties till now, I've always meditated, but those, those 10 years or so, maybe 11 years in between the first meditation and the time I started channeling, I was meditating almost every day without fail. And usually for 45 minutes to an hour um, to try to get some more energy, to try to rejuvenate myself um, so I could make it through the day. And so, yeah, it's, it was a necessity for me, I felt like, to meditate. And I also felt like because I was I was meditating all the time, I, I could do Reiki on people and feel like something was happening because I could focus quickly on, you know, meditation's all about focus. So I, I bring my focus to, okay, I'm going to access this energy and zap this person with energy. You know, that was... Even though I was I was kind of taught Reiki level one at the same time I found those conversations with God books, it wasn't like they the woman did anything other than tell me where to put my hands and how long to put my hands in those places and give me the attunement and be like, okay, now you're you're it, you're done. Like now every time you do this and you rest your hands on somebody, it's gonna happen. But because I had those years of focusing during meditation, I kind of understood that as the healer there, you know, you're participating. You're not just the, you're not just going to lay your hands on somebody and magically because somebody gave you this attunement, your, your hands are, um, are now filled with this beautiful energy. It's like, I, I understood that I need to focus and open myself up to the healing energy and let it come through me and then go out my hands. And so I would do it that way. And, um, and I never really followed that, that protocol of like, place your hands here and then here and then here. And, um, and that's how I did it. And, um, and I got these really crazy results, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can now I, I, I saw on your website, you teach people to channel as well, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to, are you finding more and more people are wanting to lean into this kind of work and can anyone channel? I, uh, in my experience, anyone can, I've even known people who have, tried for years and years and years to channel and then eventually did you know they they were able to because they stuck with it and the thing is like we're all different you know the woman who channeled the course in miracles didn't want to channel didn't know about channeling but boom all of a sudden she's channeling you know wow. um jane roberts who channeled seth she just connected to seth while writing poetry um, so it, it's different for everyone's story is a little bit different in how they start channeling. It seems like, but what I've noticed is first, first answer is yes. 
people keep coming to my classes and courses in large numbers. And um, so I offer them all the time. And I work with people in one-on-one uh, lessons that I offer too. And um, I see people making huge progress, pro- like one lesson and they're channeling uh, verbally. Um, now, some people come to me in uh, a greater state of like readiness for it. Like they've had some things happening, you know, they've had their own story of like what's been going on with them where they're getting something, they're feeling something. It's not quite coming through uh, verbally, but then I take them through a process and they can do it. So, um, and I, I don't think it's because I'm so great at it, but I do think I'm pretty good at it, you know, at, at teaching it. But I just think it's one of those convergence points, like the teacher, the student, and the master come together at the right timing and it all takes us one lesson, but then other people, you know, it, it really depends on, um, how dedicated you are. You know, as soon as I realized, like, this is a real possibility for me, no one needed to, uh, motivate me to do it af- after that. It was just purely, this is what I want to do. I, now I know what I want to do with the rest of my life as soon as, as soon as all that stuff was happening in 2010, because I didn't have a real direction in life prior to that. I thought about being a life coach. I had business cards made up and I made like a make your own website for it, but I didn't take it seriously. And once I started channeling, I started to take it more seriously my myself as someone who could do this and help other people. And then I had uh, an ex-wife come along a couple of years after I started channeling. She really lit a fire under me and taught me how to do a lot of stuff um, uh, on the internet, you know, to get myself out there more. And um, she was more, way more into the tech side of things than I ever was or ever will be. And so I was able to just start putting my stuff out there to a larger audience and, and to do so after two years of, you know, toiling in obscurity, um, I, I felt more confident to do it um, publicly and put it out there and start recording stuff, you know? Yeah. I can imagine, Hey, I, I'm just, I was just li- listening and going along with your, your journey. And I think people underestimate the back end, the business side of things and actually putting things together that is to make us available to be heard and listened to, to share our gifts to the world. Like that's a mm-hmm. huge project in itself. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's something um, I've kind of had to learn over the last 15 years myself. So that's the first mm-hmm. thing I wanted to mention. And the second thing I, I wanted to highlight was for you, when you, as you develop your skills and channeling and developing the confidence to actually put yourself out there to the world, I feel that's a journey all of us go on in some aspect to ourselves r- related to us, whether it's channeling or not. You know, there's a passion, there's something mm. that we want to share our gifts. Were you at all um, nervous or, or hesitant because, you know, channeling is deemed as unusual for mainstream and popular people think, oh, that's strange, that's, you know. Like, how did your friends respond? How did you feel putting yourself out there like that to be visibly seen? Well, most of my friends were people that I knew through Abraham, honestly. And so I had a lot of people okay. very interested <laughs> in my channeling right away. Um, but not, not, I should say a lot, you know, like a dozen or two. Um, and. So I started, those are the people I was channeling for mostly is the people that I knew through the Abraham Hicks uh, circuit. And um, so they all handled it really well. And with my family, they all handled it much more beautifully than I thought they would, you know, to the point where the last conversation I had with my 79 year old dad, he was basically saying, you know, I feel like I do that sometimes too. when I'm talking to people and they're asking me for advice and I don't know, where it's coming from. So, you know, he gets it probably better than, and my uncle 
Um, my uncle surprised the heck out of me one day and approached me in a parking lot and uh, because we were visiting my dad in the hospital and, and, um, he said, you know, um, Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad, he channeled the Quran. And I was like, cause my, my uncle's a history buff. He knows, he knows but he surprises me all the time with stuff like that. Um, where he just completely understood what it was, you know? Got it. Yeah, no, that's great. So you speak about um, the different types of channeling in terms of, like you said, some of the, um, like, uh, will channel past relatives and things, and you spoke about yeah. channeling um, higher, higher dimensional beings and ascended masters as well. Uh, there's two questions I got here, but I just want to simplify it into one. What is ascended masters then, and what is ascension? I'll go there first. Okay. Um, well, it's interesting that you're asking about ascended masters because recently I f- was sort of contacted by um, the collective of ascended masters. They, I've channeled Saint Germain, Yeshua, Buddha, uh-huh. Kuan Yin, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene. And that may be, if you consider Krishna an ascended master, so uh, people have different, their own different ideas of who's an ascended master and who isn't. Um, but um, those are a handful of them. Melchizedek, I've never channeled Melchizedek. Uh, Katumi, I've never channeled Katumi. But there's, there, there's kind of agreed upon. I've googled it several times, like who's considered ascended master. So I'm teaching people how to channel. Ascended masters, I want to give them like a full list of, of ones to choose from. And, um, but they started coming through me as a collective recently calling themselves thymus. And I had to get them to like repeat it and be like, really thymus? Like the, like the thing in the body? Like <laughs> they're like, yeah, thymus. So that's what they're calling themselves as the <laughs> collective of ascended masters. And it's interestingly enough, it's about where the high heart is and, People say you can tap on your your sternum to like get your thymus going, and um, so yeah, um, that that's in a nutshell. I think ascended masters are like they're special in the sense that they they had this purpose for their lifetime, and their purpose was to to help us, teach us, be an example to us of what's possible. Like, like Jesus slash Yeshua said, you know, this is, don't be so shocked by what I'm doing. You all can do this and more, Um, you know, and amazingly that got kept in the Bible. Um, But, you know, um, Ascension, it's interesting because there's even some stories in the Bible of people who ascended, like Elijah, I know is one that comes to mind. Someone who ascends is someone who raises their vibration so much that they go to a different dimension. They don't need a, a, a portal to do it. They don't need a, a device to do it. Um, and they don't need a solar flash to do it. Cause that's a big thing people are talking about in the new age now, because they basically awaken to such an extent, know who they are to such an extent that they're raising their vibration, raising their vibration, raising their vibration and they basically vibrate right out of the third. Well, it was the third dimension. The fourth is like a transitory dimension. It's like a border between the third and the fifth because the third is so different from the fifth. So we're in the fourth now. We transitioned in December 20, uh, 2012. And um, now here we are. Um, riding on spaceship earth through space and going through all these different sectors of space. And, you know, there's some debate as to whether we're in the photon belt or we haven't gotten to the photon belt yet, but that's a, that's a part of space that really promotes this high frequency energy um, being present on earth. And, and I think that's what we're seeing right now is we're seeing, you know, massive changes in the way people are, uh, relating to each other and, you know, we're sort of like waking up to who we are as a collective. I think there's, I think it's much more common now 
for people to be leaving an old dogmatic religion behind and saying, you know what, I feel like I'm, I'm, and my uncle's an example of that. Like he, you know, he and I have been communicating about it and he's like, you know, checking out Eckhart Tolle and he's more interested and open-minded than I ever thought he would, would be um, towards this. And, and, and you, when you see it in your life, when you see it with the people in your life, you, you understand like, oh yeah, this is, this is really happening. Like people are really understanding there's more um, to this. There's, there's more going on and it's really, you know, uh, gosh, there's so many ways to sort of dissect it. But I think that ultimately in my definition of us, of an awakened person is a person who understands that their God, everything is God and everyone is God. And that makes it that we're all one. There's only one of us here. And we're sort of recognizing that um, individually and collectively so that we can go home together. We can make it a group effort to rise up and move to the next level of consciousness. So it's sort of like moving out of the ego sense, the, the ego sense of self, which is we're very separate, you know? Yeah. Why do the ascended masters, the higher dimensional beings, this, this seems to be a lot of channeling happening at the moment. Why do you think that is? Why do they care? Why is a message coming through or want to get a message through? That's a great question. Um, first of all, uh, you know, I think Edgar Casey and Jane Roberts and Barbara Marciniak and Esther Hicks and Daryl Anka and, and others too, that I could just go on listing people who've been doing this for 35, 40 years. They really have set the the groundwork, you know, they've, they've laid the groundwork and they set the stage and the pave the way for, for people like me to come along and be like, Oh, I can do this too. Um, to, to believe it's possible. You know, the, the more people you see doing it, the more you believe it's possible. And it's not just a gift that one or two people per generation get to have. Um, so that's a big part of it, but also because it's sort of like, the same reason why ETs are paying more attention to us now than ever before. And more of them, it's because we, for one thing, we entered the atomic age in the forties. And once we did that, they really started paying more attention to us. But um, the ascended masters, the archangels, the fairies, you know, these are beings of such high vibration, such love and compassion. Of course they want to help us. Like why you see anyone struggling and you haven't an, any compassion within you, you want to help that person, you know, and, and you do so in the way that you know how. So some people might give that person money and some people might talk to that person and some people might want to give that person a job or, you know, find out like, are they lost? Do they, do they need something? Um, but there's all the, all the different ways that we try to help other people. And sometimes they backfire. Like if you ever get involved in like a dispute between two people and you try to be the mediator and you realize, Oh, this is, this does not end well for me ever when I do this. Um, so then eventually you learn that that doesn't work. Um, that sometimes we have to be, compassionate people also have to be comfortable with other people not getting along, even though it doesn't feel good to us to witness it. We have to like make peace with that. Okay. Those people are going through what they need to go through, but uh, there is also debate going on in the higher realms amongst different beings and collectives where they're going, how's what's the best way to help humanity? You know, is it is it by doing this or is it by doing that? And when I channel the Arcturian Council, they're often talking about how those debates are going on with uh, and those and these um, collaborations take place between them 
and Syrians and Pleiadians and Andromedans and even Orions and all these beings who want to help because, um, you know, they're, they're living it up, you know, they're living in paradise compared to us. And they also understand, as I was saying before, there's no separation. There's no real difference between who they are and who we are. And there's aspects of us within them because it's a holographic universe and there's aspects of them within us. So it's like, um, they get it, you know, they get that this is, this is a universal ascension. We're all doing it together, not just the humans of Earth, but all beings throughout the entire universe must work together to to make it sort of a smooth, uh, easy transition into the next level of consciousness for the entire universe. Mm-hmm. What would your lessons be or advice? Not advice, but I guess. Yeah, potentially advice on people that are feeling the squeeze right now then. If we are going into an ascension process from 3D to 5D, and to me that represents a lot of shining a light on the darkness, even within ourselves, the things that we have not addressed or healed or looked at or wanting to look at, right? And many, many people are not even aware that that's it's actually happening. They haven't even formed a relationship to that, you know, that emotional aspect to ourselves. People are listening to this. How would you encourage the transition to be smoother for them? Well, uh, you know, what the Buddha thought was awareness and um, that's what we all need more of. We need more awareness. Like what triggers you? you know, is important. It's important for you to realize, oh, that that's very triggering for me. But for somebody else, it's not, it's not very triggering for that, for that person. So they must have different darkness that they're integrating. They're in the process of maybe discovering, first of all, that they have through gaining more awareness, and then will eventually have to integrate their own their own darkness. But for you, the individual, you have to say, all right, why is that triggering me? Why does it trigger me more? Why do chemtrails trigger me more than uh, the financial system, the way it is right now, the central bank and the, the fed, if you're in the U S and all that stuff, like, why does it, why does that trigger me? Whereas somebody else is looking up at the sky and going, Oh, chemtrails. And, you know, it's a, because we all have our stuff and we all have our um, people, a lot of people I talk to get really upset about the way animals are treated. You know, it's like, or, or children, it's the, it's the innocent, you know, we, so we're, we're all facing some sort of, you know, darkness that, that has to be. The first, the first step is often, you know, you, you react to it. You have your reaction. It's emotional. It's um, like I said, you get triggered. And then hopefully you sort of like start to investigate why that is. And you deal with those emotions in a healthy way. So you're processing them. You're focusing on how they feel and where you feel them and trying to breathe your way through them and get to a, a slightly better feeling place and a slightly better feeling place with it. So then you can say, well, maybe I have some trauma around this and that's why maybe I was the perpetrator of this horrible thing in another lifetime. And, and I haven't forgiven myself yet. So if I can forgive this person out there that I can see doing this thing and it's so magnified because when I see it in them, it hurts so much inside of me to, to even witness it. Then if I could just, that's what the A Course in Miracles is all about. The message is forgiveness, you know, and I've never read The Course in Miracles. I just know this from, <laughs> from hearing other people talk about it, but, but forgiveness is so important. It's, it's so necessary because if you can't forgive someone else, you can't forgive yourself. 
you're going to be as hard on yourself as you are on somebody else and think sometimes that you're the villain in a situation. So um, that's uh, my idea of why that is. And I, I, I'm very impressed with our um, screenwriters lately and, uh, you know, the people who create these movies and these shows, I used to be a screenwriter. Yeah, that's why I moved to Hollywood back in um, 1997. And uh, I'm very impressed with how much of a message there are these days in these films and television shows of not just the usual, like good guy defeats bad guy, but it's more of like, how, how, why is the person doing something bad in the first place? And how can we maybe try to help that person and not just kill them at the end of the movie and, and have everybody feel better? Cause now the evil is, you know, eliminated, but instead it's more like, is there a way to like rehabilitate the person? I, I see that even it, there's a, there's a show, very underrated show called the flash and originally in the flash there there's, I know there's a movie called the flash too, but this was a show before it was a movie. They're always capturing these people who have powers and they're basically imprisoning them in their, their laboratory where they can't have their powers anymore. They don't have access to them. And at some point in the show, I guess the writers or somebody like realized, Hey, that's a little bit inhumane what they're doing to the, you know, to the villains on this show. They're putting them in these like really tiny cells where they don't have any ability to go outside or have visitors and they start to realize on the show, okay, we got to actually start working on how do we rehabilitate the people who have turned to a life of crime, you know, for whatever reason. And I think we see that happening more and more. And it's a sign of like people realizing, Hey, the darkness in you is just the darkness in me minus I don't have the same traumas you have, you know, like I'm, I'm fortunate enough to not have been abused in some way. And so my darkness hasn't dominated my beingness, you know? Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. The thing is, do you feel that the the planet can be rehabilitated? The people, everyone on here. And is there enough time? Is, is, is humanity going to make it? Ah, that's funny. You should say that. I had a, a post from the Arcturian Council called Is Humanity Going to Make It? Um, that I put out recently, a channeled message. I, I channel generally five times a week, a new message, um, from the Arcturians or the collective of ascended masters or somebody else. And the answer is yes. I'm, I'm much more of an optimist. And I believe in the goodness in humanity and in the, the ability for things to write themselves in a heartbeat. Like think about, think about the person who's riddled with cancer. And then one day they have a spontaneous remission. If that's possible. And I think there's plenty of anecdotal evidence to say that it's really possible and it's happening. And I don't know if you've had Anita Morjani on your show yet or not, but she's one of those people where she had a near death experience and she came back and then all the cancer has gone and they're studying her and studying her. And like, how is this possible? This just doesn't happen. And I think we're seeing these examples of um, miracles in, in life more and more to show us like, this is how quickly it can turn around. You know, the, it, when the pandemic started, regardless of how anybody feels about how it started, why it started, whether it was appropriate for lockdowns to happen, regardless of how anybody feels about that, if you look at the evidence of like how quickly the pollution went away when people were in their homes instead of in their cars, you know, um, and, and just bodies of water cleaning up like the Hudson river. I remember hearing about, which is in New York city and, you know, them seeing whales in the Hudson river for the first time. And like, I don't remember how long, how many decades, but it's, it does. And then re you read things on, on Instagram or something about like mushrooms and how mushrooms can eat these plastics and, and turn all these plastics into organic material. And, you know, we just have to, and, and also 
oil spills, I think, can be cleaned up by um, mushrooms. So, you, you know, there's a lot more hopeful stuff out there all the time for us to sort of sink our teeth into and give us that feeling of optimism. But I also think that there's so many different timelines. We're all shifting all the time from one timeline to another timeline. So if you think about, you don't even really have to clean up a polluted earth or um, fix a broken world or fix a broken self or a broken humanity. You just have to vibrate in such a way that you find yourself on a much better timeline where things are working out and, and it's happening progressively and it's happening because of what's going on inside the individuals on that timeline, not because something outside of us is happening and sort of forcing us into that state, which I think a lot of people still believe has to happen. And I think those timelines do exist. And that's why there's so many different predictions out there, even from channeled uh, beings, you know, it's, it's like um, you get to choose your timeline, you get to choose your future and people need to realize that like, it's not just one earth, one humanity, one reality. It's there's, there's so many to choose from. And that's something else that's being explored a lot in science fiction these days, a lot more, I think, than, than ever before in human history are people open to the idea of a parallel universe or at least a parallel dimension or reality. Yeah. There's, um, there's a saying that it, ran through for me years and years ago, be the change that you want to see in others. And for me, that felt very empowering and give me my power back, and knowing that I, I can make a difference and I can focus on that as opposed to everything that's not right for the world and just get pulled back into that um, exactly. constantly, which is, can be very debilitating. Yeah, that's why yeah. people really have to get uh, off the uh, internet. Daniel, I'm aware I'm coming to... <laughs> You know, the internet can keep you in that <laughs> cycle of like, oh, like this or, or listening to right, exactly. You got to listen, listen to my stuff on the internet, but just not all that other stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. But even my Facebook feed and Instagram, because of, you know, having to do social media as well, I'm, I yeah. use it. But, you know, I'm very selective what I let into my feed and, and yeah, you got very it. uplifting, actually, if, if used for the greater. Oh, yeah. Greater good I agree. Now. I agree. So I'm, I'm aware. Yeah, I'm aware I'm coming to the end of the podcast, Daniel. And um, I actually ask everyone on the show a particular question. Um, and that is, with everything we've covered today, what would you like the listeners to ponder on? But I was wondering, how do you feel about if we asked the Arcturian Council that question sure. just to wrap up the podcast. Sure. Um, just so people understand what, what they're about to see and hear, all of this is channeled. It's um, the sounds, the the tones, the movements. It's all channeled. It's their way of setting the tone for the message. And um, I don't control any of it. I don't do it to bring them in. They do it through me. I'm channeling them as soon as I decide to be channeling. And, um, I just, it's just people, I just want people to understand that because it's the, the assumption would obviously be, oh, he's doing that to get them in. But the, the, so the sounds you're about to hear are part of the channel transmission and they're working on the listener. The listener receives something from the sounds that goes beyond the mind. And then they'll come in and they'll give you something for your mind. <laughs>
on something that Daniel here started to touch upon, but didn't really complete the thought about. And that is awareness. Awareness is going to put you in your body. Awareness is going to put you in the present moment. Awareness is going to put you in the center of your heart, where you really want your consciousness to dwell most of the time. And when you are aware, you're not only aware of your thoughts, your words, and your actions, but you're also aware of your feelings, your vibration. And when you have awareness of your feelings and your vibration, you know when something is running amok inside of you and needs your attention. You are going to stop more often and address an issue when it's happening inside of you when you have the awareness to do so. And so some of the keys to living a more conscious and spiritual life there on earth are simply to breathe more consciously, to ground in your bodies, to spend more time in nature and connecting with Mother Earth so that you are aware of what's happening in your bodies. And of course, through meditation, you're more likely to notice something that's going on inside of you because in meditation, you're only supposed to be focused on what's going on inside of you and not thinking about or focusing on or looking at something that's happening out there in the world. And so that awareness that you gain through meditation helps you to shine a spotlight on whatever it is you need to shine a spotlight on inside of yourself and then address it and then shift that vibration ever so slightly with perhaps a shift of focus a different thought than the one you were thinking before. And just by having a different intention for yourself and for the next moments of your life, by being more intentional about what you're going to do and how you're going to be, how you're going to feel, you can change everything. So that's our message to all of you is that you follow these 
few simple steps and you have everything that you need to create the reality you want to experience and to change the way you feel about the reality you have already created for yourself. Because in that shifting, in that changing, you can drop all of your resistance, all of your resentment, all of your anger, all of your judgment, all of your fear, all of your anxiety, and just live blissfully in the moment, the moment which has everything in it that you could ever want or need. Very good. That is our message to all of you. We are the Arcturian Council, and we have enjoyed connecting with you. Hey, Guy. Thank you kindly, sir. Boy, I can feel an energy come in. Oh, oh good. Mate. <laughs> That's always a good yeah, sign. That's big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I know we had a few internet challenges as we're recording here, but uh, yeah. just beautiful, mate. Thank you so much. And where can You're I send welcome. people? There'll be links in the show notes, but if people want to find out more about your work, where can they go, buddy? Well, in addition to the website, danielscranton.com, there's also the YouTube channel, which is just my name, uh, Daniel Scranton, where I literally have thousands of videos of me channeling. And, um, you know, my Instagram is, uh, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's Daniel Scranton channels and, uh, Facebook is, um, facebook.com slash Daniel, the channel. If you want to just go directly to my page and follow me there, but, um, yeah, they, you, those are the four major ways to start, uh, tuning in more to my work with, if you go on my website, you can get a free um archangel michael guided meditation if you sign up for the newsletter and get the email sent every day that will have a uh, most of the time a new message in them beautiful yep. daniel thanks so much buddy appreciate it thank you guy nice meeting you